You're listening to LVB Podcast Show with your friend, advocate, and host, Alvaro. Hello and welcome to LVB Show. My name is Alvaro and I'm very happy to be with you tonight. Okay, so first of all, I want to say thank you so much to everyone listening from the United States, from Canada, from Europe, especially from the UK, as our guest is from the UK, and also thanks for listening to people in Africa, in Asia, in Latin America. We have listeners everywhere in the world, thankfully. And this interview is particularly interesting to me because our guest, his name is Tony uh, Giles, I hope I'm pronouncing okay your last name, my friend. That's correct, Tony Giles, yeah. Thank you. Uh, so our friend here, he is totally blind and he's 80% deaf. But this guy is not letting anything stop him from doing what he wants. He has traveled all these planet Earth which is unbelievable, over 2,500 countries he has been in, and he has a lot to tell us. I also want to say that this interview is going to be uh, transcribed in Spanish because I belong to the Colombian Association for Deaf and Blind People, and we want to inspire people in Colombia who are deaf-blind to understand that everything is possible regardless of whatever you may have. So it's very important to listen to this carefully and enjoy and learn a lot. So thank you, Tony, so much for being with us tonight. You're welcome. My pleasure. So, Tony, the first question I have for you is where do you come from? Uh, so I come from... Uh, near a city called Bristol in southwest England and I, I now live in a smaller city uh, in the far west of England and the nearest big city to me that people might know is called Plymouth. Oh, very interesting. And can you tell us please what is the cause of your blindness and your hearing problem? Uh, so I was born with a rare genetic eye condition called cone dystrophy and photophobia. So this means I don't have any color nerves and uh, my eyes are very sensitive to bright light. And as a baby and as a small child, I was very sensitive to all lights. Um, and I played in the dark for the first two years of my life. When I was about three years old, I was given dark glasses and then I eventually played in the street with my other friends. Um, and because my eyes were so sensitive to light and I had what is called, the I didn't have any color nerves, but I had the nerves in the back of my eye, which allowed me to sense and see in dim light. So like walking into a cinema, you can see in dim light. So I was able to see shapes and shadows from a young age. And I could also read and write with very big black letters on white paper. And I could sense the contrast with my eyes. So I was able to read and write and run around and kick a football and until about the age of eight or nine. And then my eye condition has not changed. Um, but my sensitive, sensitivity to light changed. As I got older, my sensitivity to light lessened. And all I can sense now is very bright sunlight. Um, and I, my hearing loss began when I was about four or five. And both my eye condition and my hearing loss is uh, are both due to nerve damage. Um, but they don't know why. You also had a kidney transplant. Why? So, yeah, in 2008, I had a successful kidney transplant. Um, 
and in 2002, I was diagnosed with kidney failure. Um, and they're not 100% sure why, but they think it could be something to do with a digestion problem at a very young age. Um, the acid in my stomach didn't digest properly and it damaged my kidneys, but they don't understand what, what caused it and if there's any relationship between my kidney damage and my eye and ear condition. So that's why. And I um, I had high blood pressure and this was damaging the kidneys. So that needed to be controlled with medication. But they, um, the, when they discovered the kidney damage, it was um, nearly 40% damage. They couldn't reverse the problem, but they could slow it down with medication. And then I eventually had a successful kidney transplant. So now I have my kidneys, but also someone else's kidney. And my kidney is very healthy. Well, my body is very healthy. So I'm able to travel and do things. That's great for our listeners. And probably many are thinking, so how did he manage to deal with blindness, hearing loss, kidney transplant, and become <laughs> the person you are now in terms of your understanding and accepting of your disability, but not letting that stop you. Tell us about that process. So when I was five years old, I went to a specialist a school for children, for disabled children, about 30 kilometers from my home each day. And I was taken there by taxi, which is paid for by my local education authority. And as I said, I learned to read and write. Um, and I wasn't very deaf and I was given uh, hearing aids at about the age of five. So I played with other children and I ran around and I did um, everything other children did. But um, as I got older and my eye condition, uh, the sensitivity of my eyes changed and I stopped reading uh, with print, I then was went to a boarding school um, 400 kilometers from my home at the age of 10 and a half. And I stayed there for six weeks or eight weeks at a time. And it was at this specialist school for visually impaired and blind children that I learned to use Braille, um, the dots that blind people use to read and write. And I learned to use mathematics and also algebra in Braille. And then when I was about 11 years old, um, I began to learn mobility training. So to use a long white cane and to search for objects on the ground and um, basically to become um, mobile and at first to, just to get from place to place around my school, um, which was like a big campus with roads and fields and paths. Um, and then eventually to get off to school and to go up to the local shops, which would be about a five minute walk. And by the age of 13 and 14, I was able to uh, cross busy roads and catch buses and eventually catch the train home, which would take about three hours to, my, to visit my family. And I was aged about 15 and 16. So I was at a specialist school and I was given confidence by my teachers and, and I learned the typical subjects at any school, English, maths, history, geography, music, um, physical exercise. We would go swimming each week or we would do athletics and um, I like to play the drums. And, Um, I took my exams when I was 16, and this allowed me to go to a college for the blind um, where I undertook um, more intense study in uh, individual subjects. And I, I, um, I studied history, uh, mathematics, and human biology for two years, and this allowed me to go to university. 
Um, and it's a university for everybody, so it's not specialists. It's, um, we don't have universities for blind people in the UK. So I just went to a regular university, and by then I was using computers with speech screen reading software so I could research um, and study and read books. And I would scan the books into the computer, and then it, I would listen to the books for hours and remember what I was reading. And then I also used to get my my fellow students that were in the same classes as me to read to me. And then we would learn together because I would remember it all and then I would test them. So that's how I studied. And that's how I got to university and that's how I slowly began to travel. I was very fortunate that when I was 16 years old, I got the opportunity to visit Boston in the USA with my school. And um, my, the school I, I went to also had children, not just blind children, but children with other disabilities, uh, children who couldn't walk very well and who were in wheelchairs. So I realized from a young age that being blind and partially deaf wasn't the most difficult uh, disability. Tony, what a great story. Um, yeah. I would like to know, what do you do for a living? Um, so, um, in the UK, um, education is free for everybody, um, um, including university, until 2001. So I was able to go to university for free and get some money from the government to buy specialized equipment. Um, so after I finished university, which I also spent for five months in the USA, in South Carolina, and this allowed me to travel and experience more of the world and gain more confidence. And I decided that um, this is what I wanted to do. I wanted to travel and meet people and have world experiences. Um, but when I was 16 years old, my dad died and passed away, and he left me his pension. He worked for the railway for 25 years, so he left me his pension that he got every month when he retired, and now I get that. And I also get some money from the government uh, for being disabled. Um, So I'm very lucky and I'm able to live on this money. And I live alone, I have my own apartment and I pay my rents every month. And I spend the rest of my money on traveling. I've done some voluntary work. Um, I worked in a museum uh, in uh, American history uh, for several years as a room guide. And I've also um, worked in a local library where I put some braille labels on audio books uh, so blind people could come in and read the, uh, the book titles themselves. So I've done various voluntary works, but I've never actually done any paid work. But I'm um, very lucky in other countries, um, in other countries around the world, it's not uh, so easy to get uh, benefits if you're disabled. You're right about that, Tony. Certainly in <laughs> Colombia, <laughs> um, yeah, things. Yeah, I it's very difficult. <laughs> yeah, in, and in Latin America in general, and and well in the U.S., um, having many options and everything, they they do not have. Uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, my American listeners, but I don't think they have the same options than in the U.K. as far as university cost comes so no, no. right yeah yeah i know yeah um, it, it has changed now um uh, students have to pay to go to university in the uk um but there are um there are possibilities to um to get loans um from the university grants and such things but you have to have to sort of apply for them and it's it can be quite bureaucratic So, and, I was very fortunate. 
Right, right. You you were very fortunate, but but also for our listeners, you 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 also were uh, brave enough and, and had the courage to to make things happen, my friend. Because yeah, yeah. very deter very determined. Yeah, and I had um I have a very supportive family. Um, my mum is very uh, very positive and very um she pushed me to do things and she she sort of would fight every situation for me, so I was very fortunate with that, and my brother and sister also, um, and stepdad support me a lot, so and encourage, encourage me to do things. And that is very important, encouragement is very, very important, yeah, and, yeah. And, and having a support system is very, very important, I always say that mm -hmm. to people everywhere. Um, and I would like to know, Tony, if you could think about it, what would be the biggest challenge you have faced in your life um, I suppose all of my disabilities uh, being blind and being deaf um, together is a big challenge particularly in social situations because obviously I can't lip read, and so that that's the biggest challenge is in groups and um, making myself understood, particularly when traveling in foreign countries where English isn't necessarily the first language. And when I'm traveling to, say, in South America or Russia or Japan, I try and learn a few basic words You know, hola, hello, uh, star, how are you? <laughs> Wa or agua, water. But um, it's very difficult for me being deaf. Right. To, to, to learn languages on, you know, in detail. So that's one of my biggest challenges. And obviously, um, my kidneys were was a big challenge before I had my transplant. Because I was becoming sicker and sicker every year. So... That was that was a challenge, but um, I had a positive attitude always, and I um, always believed that people would help me. And it's about communicating with people, and I believe that you know we should help each other. So um, I always sort of have faith in the, the the good nature of people when I travel around the world. So in. Tony, I would like to know, do you feel one of the biggest obstacles in life for people is fear itself, is, is saying, I'm scared, I'm paralyzed, I'm in my comfort zone. <laughs> What would you recommend to them listening right now and thinking, yeah, he has done it, but I'm not able to go to buy anything in the street because I'm scared I'm going to get hit by a car. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I started doing things from a very young age and I was given the confidence from a young age and told that I would do things. And so I never really had the fear. I never really knew what the, the fear was of, oh, this might happen or that might happen. My attitude was always, Well, I will do this, and I can accomplish this. So sometimes it might take two or three attempts to do something, and um, I might have to stop and start again. And um, I always realized that I it was okay to ask for help, and that I needed help. And everyone needs help to to do things, to do tasks, to find information, and not to be afraid to ask people, um, to ask strangers, because people could only say, yeah, I'll help you, or no, I won't. And then if somebody says no or they can't, you ask the next person. Um, yes, um, it can be scary walking down the street, um, even just exit, even just, even just going out of your house. That can be the scariest thing and the hardest thing for some time. Um, whether you're physically disabled or not. Um, but once you make that first step, 
and then the next step and the next step it becomes easier and easier the first time is the most difficult time but then you just say to yourself well if I don't have a go then I'll never know and if I do try then okay it's scary but then if I try I might find it not so scary and what I might find might be positive so and I always say, I always say to people people who are disabled they want to travel but they don't know how to well then the best way is to start in a place where you're familiar that you know where the culture is similar and you can speak the language and maybe for your first journey or for your first um, outing, uh, go with a friend or a family member um, and build up your confidence and then take it step by step. So that's my ad advice. Very good advice for our listeners. And I would like to know, do you exercise a lot in order to be able to travel so you are in good shape? Yeah, I'm in reasonably good shape. I'm about <laughs> uh, 70 kilograms. Um, I'm a meter 62 tall. Yeah, good. Um, yeah. I, eat, I eat reasonably well. Um, I do my own cooking. Um, I probably eat too much chocolate. but uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't do any sort of extra exercise. I don't go to the gym or anything. Um, I walk everywhere. Or I use public transport. Um, I live on the second floor, um, so I go up and down three lots of stairs every every day. Um, I try and, and get out at least once a day and walk around my small town. Um, but when I'm traveling, I'm sort of exercising more and walking more, and I like to do lots of sort of activity like um, kayaking and white water rafting. I like to go bungee jumping, so I sort of exercise that way, and I like to do a lot of um, walking around cities, and I'll, I'll often join a um, a walking tour, so I can meet other people, other travelers, and get to explore the city, and also gain you know, lots of information, history, and interesting stories about cities. So, yeah, I don't, but I don't do any sort of extra. Uh, fitness ex ex activities so, but that's just that's just me and Tony do you have any tips on getting oriented when you walk in any neighborhood any tips or strategies you use um, I just use long cane um, I always get um, the address Uh, of the place I'm staying and I ask my um, hostel staff or uh, if I'm staying with a local person I get them to write down their address in the local language so I can show a taxi driver or someone on the street if I get lost and then um, I'll ask for directions so I'll say well, okay when I walk out the door do I turn left do I turn right and then How many blocks is it to the bus stop or, or to the supermarket or to the nearest cafe? And then, um, and that's the same. I get them to tell me directions to the, the nearest metro if I want to, to go to um, a historical museum or um, uh, something of interest. And then I just ask people on the street and I show them a piece of paper, the place I want to visit, and just keep asking people until... I, someone shows me the way and then I also I count and remember the streets I cross so if I'm walking to the supermarket I'll I'll try and remember that if I cross one street or two street or how many times I've turned left or turned right or and I'll I'll try and remember um, obstacles I might may have hit with my cane like um um Uh, have I hit two lampposts or three lampposts or um, things like this? So I try and use landmarks at the, at the local area to give me clues. And then I remember it and, and I can walk back. 
in my mind and I can remember the route usually, usually. And then, like I say, if I get really stuck or have a problem, and I just get a taxi and show them the address. So that's how I travel. And some blind people now are using um, uh, iPhones and smartphones to help them find places and you Google map and they talk to them. Um, my girlfriend has a smartphone that talks to her, but I don't tend to like them because they're all touch screen. So I just tend to use my cane and the public and it, uh, it, it seems to work. <laughs> Why you don't like touch screen? Um, cause I feel like I'm just, it's just a, an empty, it's just a flat screen. And I feel like, I'm just sort of poking around until I find something that speaks. And it just feels very, very frustrating and very, <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I just, I don't have the patience, I guess. <laughs> and also, I think also with my hearing, I tend to struggle with the speech voices. Uh. Um, whereas I, I use JAWS on my laptop and it's, it's a really strong voice and a really clear voice for me. Right. So. Oh. I now use I now use digital hearing aids, which are really good. Cause they make they make the sound more specific and more clearer. They cut out a lot of the background noise, so that's better. But I like Jaws. It's expensive, but it's it's a good sound for me. Now, Tony, can you give us a sense when you plan a route? Let's say you are going from where you live to a country in Africa. How do you plan your route? How do you plan your trip? What do you have to take into account before traveling? Okay, so I need to do your research. If you're blind, you need information because you can't just pick up a book or click through a magazine as you're traveling. Right. You don't have that option. So I get on my laptop and I decide I want to go to Ghana or I want to go to Colombia. So first of all, I need to know, okay, what flight options are available, uh, how much they cost, etc. So I'll uh, research on the internet the flights and I put in Colombia, flights to Colombia as a Google search and it'll give me options. And then I will usually contact my mom or a friend and get them to help me book a flight because uh, air, air company websites are not very good uh, if you're blind and using a screen reader. So once I have my flight booked, uh, I get an email. So I have all the information about my flight and, and then I will uh, call up the air company and tell them I am blind and I uh, want assistance from the airport check-in desk to through security and customs to the boarding gate and onto the plane and also meeting at my destination. So I book this and anyone, any disabled person in any country can book this and it's free. And then the, uh, it's got special assistance in the airport. Well, once you go to the check-in desk or the airport, they will assist you onto the plane and off at your destination so once that's booked then i start to research about the country i want to visit so at first i want to know what accommodation is available so i usually stay in hostels which is a shared accommodation i there's a room with six beds or eight beds um, bunk beds so one on top of the other and i like to to use this type of accommodation because it's cheap and also that way you're meeting other travelers and backpackers and they can help me visit interesting places and it's I was often found it's a way of making good friends and meeting people from different nationalities and cultures and now I've started using something called Couchsurfing there's a website called Couchsurfing.com and then you can stay with people in different countries along around the world and often it's, it's local people from that country so you're getting more of a a local experience and meet, experiencing the real culture rather than just meeting other foreigners. And um, so I go on this website and people have a profile. Um, they have a photo and they normally 
but their age, their name, their job, um, where they live, what they can offer, whether it's a bed or, 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 or it's um, a couch to sleep on for two or three days. And it's free, and you can read their profile, and you can read their references of other people that stayed with them and what they say about them. And then you send them a message saying, my name's Tony, I'm traveling, I want to come and stay with you because you sound interesting, I want to experience your culture. And this is a great way to travel and it's free. And then you just offer them a bit of money for coffee or you take them for a meal at the end of your stay. And it's a way of exchanging cultures. So this is how I travel. And then I'm... Um, so once I've arranged my accommodation in the country I'm going to visit, then I find out how to get from the airport to where I'm going to stay by, do I need to take a taxi or can I take a bus or a subway train or can I walk? Or sometimes the people I'm going to stay with will meet me, sometimes not. And then I find out about places I want to visit and this is all by using the internet. So I use a website, a website called uh, Wiki Travel. So say I'm coming to Colombia, I'll put in Colombia Wiki Travel or Bogota Wiki, Tra Wiki Travel, and I can read all about Bogota and I can read about how to get around the city the cheapest way, um, how to use the buses or the metro, um, places to visit, like museums or historical monuments or waterfalls, which is what I'm interested in. Anything of sound or statues I can touch. Um, places I can go hiking or somewhere I can bungee jump. And then I get all this information and I copy it into a Word document. And then I save this information on a portable uh, digital uh, small machine called a, uh, the one I have is called a Victor, Victor Stream Reader. So I can listen to this information while I'm traveling on the plane or traveling on the bus. Um, if I don't have internet, I can still listen to the information. So I've got the knowledge. And this is, this is the key for blind people. We need to have the knowledge beforehand. And then I also have the name and the address of the accommodation recorded where I'm staying. And then I, I look at information about the country. So what's the national dish of Colombia or um, how much your bus is, what's the local currency, what's the weather going to be like. And then I can decide if I want to travel, you know, in, in, in the hot conditions or cooler conditions. Um, so this is how I plan it all. And then I also, if, I, if I'm going to Africa or South America, I need to know what um, injections I might need. Do I need malaria tablets? All this information. So, I, I, and, then, and then finally, um, if I'm going to a country or maybe more than one country, so sometimes I travel in South America and I might go from Colombia to Ecuador and Ecuador to Peru. So I plan a route and I plan the different cities I might want to visit and get information for all these different cities. And then I have all this information. And then I, um, I travel to the airport. I take the train from my home. And again, I can book assistance and they help me on the train at the station and they help me off at the other end. And then they'll take me up to the airport and then another member of staff will take me through the airport to the check-in desk. And if I can't find an official staff, then I'll just ask the public to help me. Um, as, long, as long as I got the information, then I can travel. And then it's the question of once I get to my accommodation, uh, asking people, all right, I want to go and visit this, this uh, interesting museum. Uh, how can I get there? What's the easiest way to get there? Or um, what tours are available to hike to this waterfall or uh, go rafting? So, yeah, I ask lots of questions. And then I keep meeting people in the hostel or on the street. Um, and that's how I travel. Tony, have you ever thought of becoming a travel agent? I thought about working for a travel agent, um, but um, I'm more interested in traveling myself at the moment. <laughs> but I think um, um, I'm now starting to get um, 
uh, people emailing me, blind and visually impaired people emailing me and asking me um, for advice and stuff. So that's quite nice. Um, I've been talking to a guy in Brazil and he wanted to come um, to Italy and Sweden and he was he was a bit concerned how he'd be able to get around with people help him. So I gave him some advice and that was quite nice. So um, maybe one day I could, I could um, open my own hostel and, and I could... Um, help people who want to travel. That would be quite nice when sure. I get old and retire. <laughs> <laughs> sure. I think you also would be great to give advice to travel agencies around the world that are trying to be uh, inclusive for everyone. I think that would be a wonderful yeah, thing. Yeah, that would be good. Hotels and, right. and companies yeah, that right. want to be inclusive. That would be good. And um, I've just started giving talks um, um I gave a couple of talks to different universities this year, and I'm also going to a couple of conferences later in the year. So I'm having to talk about my experiences and um, not just disabled people, but non-disabled people um, to get them to understand more that uh, not to be afraid to interact with disabled people um, because people want to help, but they're often worried how, well, how do I approach someone who's blind or partially deaf? You know, do I... How do I, how do I talk to them if they can't hear me very well or can't see me? So it's breaking down these barriers. So that's interesting. Very important. Very important for our listeners. See. And and I think and we have a lot of listeners in the U.S. Um, mm. Many organizations should bring you for speaking and also here in Colombia. Yeah, we, we, we will be doing that in the future. I'm sure. Yeah, definitely. That would be really good. Now, I have a question related to your trips in Ease. What happens when you get sick, but you are on your own? How do you deal with that? Um, so, um, before I had my kidney transplant, I had to be very careful um, about not getting dehydrated um, and also be careful about what food I ate. Um, Um, fresh fruit and salad, particularly in Africa and South America where um, hygiene standards are not necessarily um, as good as in, say, in Europe or the UK um, or Australia. So um, I had to make sure that all the food I eat is cooked. Um, I take medication with me for my kidneys and spare medication. And I also take a letter explaining well, what medication mm -hmm. I'm on. Ooh what medication am I on and um, why I need it. Um, because uh, particularly traveling in the Middle East, they ask you, they're very sort of um, particular about what medication you can bring into the country. So it's important to have um, information explaining why uh, why I need it. Um, so yeah, that's what I do. I, I avoid trying to avoid eating salad because um, it's um, washed in, in local water. And I try and drink try and get bottled water and I make sure that any bottled water I drink when I'm traveling um, is sealed. Um, so yeah, or drink tea. Um, and if I'm going to Asia, I try and avoid eating meat. Um, I'm planning to go to uh, India, um, if not this year, then next year. And I know in India, I had to be extremely careful and probably just be vegetarian for a month <laughs> and avoid the, avoid the meat. So, because, um, but yeah, but, so I've been pretty lucky. I've only been sort of um, sick a couple of times traveling. And um, so pretty, very, very fortunate. And one of the, one of the downsides about having a kidney transplant is um, that you have to take uh, medication to reduce your immune system because the body wants to fight um, the donated kidney. So um, because your immune system is reduced, it means you're more vulnerable to getting uh, colds and viruses. And whereas an, a normal person um, would only maybe take a week to get over a virus, it takes me three or four weeks sometimes. So um, sometimes I just have to sort of, if I get a cold, I just have to sort of um, stay in one place a bit longer and I drink lots of uh, orange juice and eat lots of oranges and bananas and 
and hopefully um, it gets rid of the virus quick, quicker, quickly. Um, I don't take any travel insurance, uh, any um, medical insurance, because it just costs too much money. So, um, and I just decided if I get really sick, then I'll just yeah, go home, change my flight and go home. But so far, I've not had to do that, luckily. So, tell our listeners, in how many countries have you been already? So, I visited, well, hmm. According to the United Nations, there's 193 sovereign countries, and out of that list, I've been to 115. But I have my own list, which is about 250 countries or so, and, uh, and on that list, I've been to 131. But the United Nations doesn't recognize countries like Greenland or the Faroe Islands, for instance, or um, Western Sahara is disputed. Um, so they're not complacent. Um, sovereign countries and um yeah so tell us I've, I've also i should say i've also been yes. to um all seven continents of the world including antarctica i did a cruise from um, the bottom of argentina that's pretty amazing and i've also visited all 50 u.s states and all 10 provinces in canada and i've been to every south american country now I'm pretty lucky. That's that's incredible. That's that's hard to even believe. <laughs> yeah, yeah. South, South, South America is amazing. It's, you've got everything there from huge mountains in the Andes, to, uh, massive places in Argentina and Chile and the Amazon and Peru and Brazil and then Colombia's got its beaches and its it's salsa, so. and empanadas, of course. <laughs> empanadas, what would we do empanadas, without yeah. the empanadas? <laughs> empanada, arepa and empanadas. Arepa, yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and beautiful women. So. Well, that has to be said as well for our listeners. Very well said, Tony. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Tony, tell us an anecdote that can inspire people Anything that you say, oh my God, this was a real adventure. So, um, well, every day is an adventure for me. <laughs> um, um, when I'm not living in England, um, but even even sometimes going to somewhere in England um, I've not been before can can be an adventure. Even though I, you know, I I know the culture and I speak the language. Um, Going somewhere you don't know, um, you're having to ask, oh, how do I get, how do I get from the train station to my hostel? And sometimes you'll be, you know, confident to take a local bus, but then you don't always know where the bus is going to stop. And then sometimes um, you ask to go to the bus station, and then you discover that um, uh, the bus route can't always go the, the way it would normally go because it might be road construction and sometimes you might get dropped off in a different place that's uh, what you imagine and you might have to walk a further distance to get to your accommodation um that can be quite a challenge um just this week i went up to um nottingham which is um in the east midlands um to listen to the cricket england are playing india cricket <laughs> uh, which is, is a game, it's a bit similar to baseball, but slightly more complicated. Right. And it la the game can last five days. So, um, and I live in the far west, and I had to go to Nottingham. So it's a five-hour train journey, and I had to change trains two times. So I booked the assistance, and that was not a problem. They helped me onto the train at, at where I live, and then changed trains half an hour later, and then... I had a three-hour train and then changed. And when I got to Nottingham, it was reasonably late in the evening, um, and I knew there was a free city bus. Um, I thought, oh, I'll take that, and it'll be able to get me to the centre, then I can just uh, walk to my accommodation. But when I got there, the bus had stopped running, so um, I said, oh, uh, can I get a taxi? So the man who was working at the station took me out to say, yeah, I'll get a taxi. But we went out there, and he couldn't find any taxis. She says, oh, they've all gone. So we walked around for maybe two or three minutes until he found one. And then I took a taxi to 
at my accommodation and checked in and and the staff showed me to where I was staying and then the next morning I um I was while I was staying was in a building across from the um the main building so I um I walked out of the building where I was staying and I found the lights um because there were tax cell bumps on the ground so I was able to find the the traffic lights across the street and um in the UK um some of the audio crossings beep when it's green and some of them have um a small um a small round object underneath the box that spins when the light's green so you know when to cross the road unfortunately the one i was uh, using the um the tactile um, object had been uh, pulled out so i am um, i had to wait until uh, another pedestrian came along to tell me it was okay to cross so somebody did i crossed the road and i found the, the main building and i asked directions to go to the cricket ground so they told me yeah walk outside the building turn left um walk down the street till you find the next set of traffic lights cross over and you'll eventually find the bus station so i did this um and i asked uh so another person helped me cross the lights and then i said oh i'm going to the bus station so they showed me to the bus station and i walked in inside and then um i stood still and sort of listened till i could hear other people walking towards me and then asked them for the bus i wanted so somebody showed me to the bus stop and then when the bus came i which i could hear because it has a, a quite sort of noisy diesel sounding engine so i got on the bus and told the bus driver oh, i'm going to the cricket ground can you tell me when to get off at my stop and they did so about a 10 10 minute journey later i got off and then i had to find the entrance to the cricket ground so this is quite difficult because um i was on a street which was quite open and there were lots of people um moving about because they were all going to, to the to cricket match so i started walking along the street and then um start asking people oh, i'm going to the cricket are you going to the cricket where's the entrance and then um i met someone and they said, yeah we're going to the cricket so they showed me to the entrance and then i got staff at the entrance to the cricket ground and they took me to my seat um but then when i wanted to go to the toilet or i wanted to get something to eat um they told me that oh where you're to the left of where your seat is five seats along there's some steps down and then you'll be able to find um places to eat so um so when the cricket was um having like a break i went down and i met, met some people by the steps and just asked them for the toilet or places to get a burger so um yeah it's better. i did this for two days so this is my adventure and i met lots of different people at the cricket match and people in their 60s and 70s and the children who were 10 and 11 years old and um, people from India had come to watch, so all different people, different ages and different backgrounds. So it was a real challenge and it was really interesting. Um, and it sort of just demonstrates that how I'm able to get about in a busy area, in a busy place which is unknown to me, just by using my cane and asking people. That was a great example of how you get around. Thank you for that. Yeah. In I always have this question for for my guest in general who travel in East. How do you deal when you go to the beach? How do you get around? Uh, the beach? Well, um, I'm very fortunate where I live. I live about a three, four minute walk from the beach. So here I can just, um, I know the route um, and I am. Um, when I get to the beach, when I get onto the sand, it's more difficult because um, there's not so many landmarks. So, um, and the problem with my beach is if I get too close to the wall, um, I can hit my head on it because it sort of overhangs. Um, it's sort of rather than being a, just a straight wall, it sort of goes up and then sort of curves upwards and outwards. But if I go too sort of too far to the left, I can end up in the sea, um, which I can hear. So that can be quite complicated, and obviously, with the sand being quite soft, my stick uh, often gets stuck. Um, so I just sort of 
go on the, on the beach and I use the sea as a sort of guide. I sort of try just walk slowly and then, um, yeah, try and sort of use the, the sea and the wall, but sort of not 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 um not get too close to the wall and sort of I sort of sort of push my stick out a bit further than I'd normally use it. And then when I'm travelling in um in other countries um. Again, I use the sa- the sea, the sound of the sea as a guide, and um, um, again, ask people. When I was um, I went to the beach quite a lot when I was travelling in Brazil, and um, I learned the word for beach, um, and then I just asked local people. I said the beach, and then I would say sort of um, empanada or, <laughs> or agua, and then I get people to sort of show me to food stands or cafes and. Yeah, that's how I did it. And then if I wanted to go swimming, that was quite difficult because um, I was traveling by myself. So I thought, mm. oh, if, if I leave my stuff, someone could take it. Um, or um, if it was a place where there were lots of people, then my, my other worries was that I, if I went into the sea, obviously I'm moving. So when I came out again, I wouldn't necessarily be in the same location as where I left my stuff. Right. So um, that was a bit tricky, but um, yeah, it, it was, um, I sort of would um, leave, like, leave my bag like on a seat or next to my towel and then I'd leave something there that was sort of quite distinctive and, and then, um, yeah, just sort of get people to, to sort of keep an eye on my things, or sort of try and sit next to a family or something, and then, um, and people are usually quite helpful because they can tell straight away if you're blind, even if you've not got your stick. <laughs> Just sort of the way you sort of walk about, I guess. So, but yeah, that that can be quite difficult sometimes. Um, if you if you if um if you if you're by yourself. Um. So so yeah. In. Tony, um, is there one place from all the places you have been in that you said this is the best place or the most interesting place I have been in from all of them? Um, I still tell people that New Zealand is my favorite country out oh. of 131. Um, I think because it reminds me of England in a lot of ways, the weather is similar. It rains a lot in New Zealand, and it can get very windy and quite cold. Um, and the nature's similar to some extent. There's a lot of sheep and a lot of countryside, and um, you can go hiking in the countryside and, and get away from people quite quickly. Um, but I just find the New Zealanders extremely friendly and relaxed people. And the other thing about New Zealand, if you want to do any kind of crazy sport, you can do so. I did my first bungee jump in New Zealand, which was fantastic, jumping off a bridge with uh, a rubber cord tied to my ankles and not knowing what would happen, I just sort of dropped into midair and eventually bounced. And when I hit the first bounce, I didn't know it was going to happen. It was like running into a brick wall and your whole body just explodes. And it was, oh, the energy was incredible. And then I also tried a sport called Zorbing where they put you into a big plastic ball, a bit like a very large beach ball or football, and then um, they close the door and you're inside, and they roll you down a hill, and you bounce up and down and go round and round, and that's very exciting. Oh, wow. Yeah, I really love that. I recommend uh, people try absorbing me if they can. Um, and I also went whitewater rafting, and I went kayaking several times with other people. So um, I enjoy all these sort of, Uh, adrenaline rush activities because so, I can feel everything with my body so that was really good that's what I liked about New Zealand and you can hear the nature you can experience obviously hiking you feel the gradients going up and down on your feet and different terrain under your feet sand or gravel or mud or and then I was able to hear and smell seals and penguins and different birds so that was really nice but I like Um, I like South America, I like the crazy enough of Brazil <laughs> and Colombia and the parties and I like southern Argentina and southern Chile 
Patagonia because it's quite cold and I like that sort of colder climate. Um, Cat- Catahina is a bit too hot for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh boy. Yeah. So and Iceland. Iceland's one of my favourite countries. Again, I think for its sort of isolation and sort of rugged climate and um, volcanic mountains and places and friendly people. So, and then I like Turkey and Indonesia for its cuisine and its um, its people, its friendly atmosphere. So, I like lots of different places. But yeah, I'd say I'd say New Zealand is is my favourite. Now, Tony, two questions. One, sometimes do you feel lonely when you travel alone? And secondly, I have so many friends in New York City. We have to talk about, I'm sure you have been in New York. What was your experience, especially in the subway? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, no, I don't, feel, I don't feel alone when I'm traveling because even though I'm traveling alone or by myself individually, you're never really alone because there's, there's always other people around. There's usually other travelers or there's local people. Um, sometimes it can be a bit, a bit, a bit, um, maybe lonely or a bit sad if you're sort of having a meal alone night after night after night. And, but usually you can find someone to have a meal with or, Even if you're in a restaurant by yourself, the waiters will come and talk to you. Or, you know, so, you, yeah, you're, ne you're never really alone. Um, sometimes if you've got a long, long wait for a, a flight, a delayed bus or a train, that can get a bit boring and a bit sort of, um, well, not much to do. But, you know, I just listen to an audio book or listen to some rock music or something. So, or, you know, go and find people to talk to. So... And then now I've got my girlfriend, so I Skype her um, and stuff when I'm feeling a bit bored. So, uh, and uh, yeah, regarding New York, uh, <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's an amazing city. Um, although, funny enough, the first time I visited, I was, it was 19 or 20, um, and I went with a friend, and we found it a bit, um, I don't know, a bit, a bit rude or a bit aggressive. <laughs> Really, um, New York? <laughs> yeah, yeah. We we found it we found it quite harsh. I think it's because we quite we were quite young and we couldn't drink because of the age restriction. So <laughs> we found it a bit um, difficult to sort of um, to yeah to get a, get a good feel the first time. But then I went back and I went back and I realized the people sort of once you get to know them they were quite cool. And I think New York City, particularly Manhattan. It's probably the easiest city to get around if you're blind because you, everything's on a grid system almost, so you just count streets. And obviously with the number system, you know, if you're going uptown or downtown, and again, when you get on the subway, again, you can hear the announcements. So, you know, if you're going to 34 or 42nd or whatever. So, I mean, it's, it's quite easy. And then people think, oh, it must be difficult to get around the subway if you're blind. But I think it's quite easy because... Once you get off the train, you've got two options. You can either go left or right, and eventually you'll you'll find the steps up to the next level. <laughs> that's so. that's a good way to put it. I I've been in New yeah. York many times, and and yeah, sometimes I I take the wrong way, and I well, you have to go back and and and, and do yeah, it the, exactly. the other way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and then you know when you want to use the um the ticket machine, it's got braille on it and stuff, so it's it can be it can be. Yeah, pretty, pretty independent in New York City, um, I think. Um, yeah, it's a cool place. It's a great, great atmosphere. The bars and the clubs. And uh, the second time, the second time I went, uh, my friend um, noticed um, he's an advertisement for um, an Iron Maiden rock concert. Can you imagine that in New York? <laughs> <laughs> that was amazing. Yeah, that was really cool. And I obviously went to the Empire State Building and went to the um, Ellis Island, the Statue of Liberty, so the usual sites and stuff. And then now I got friends there now, so I just go and hang out with them and yeah, get taken to good places to eat. And um, 
I got um, what, what, uh, a couple is um, one of them from England and the other, um, her husband's from uh, Puerto Rico uh, originally. So uh, we went to um, we went to a Puerto Rican bar and had some really good uh, sort of Latin food and there's some Latin music. It was really nice. Oh, yes, bit, bit of salsa dancing. Just <laughs> <laughs> so swinging my hips. <laughs> Always is good to dance, my friend. <laughs> oh yeah, feel the rhythm. Yes, and I I cannot let you go um, without asking how did you meet your girlfriend? Ah yes yes. Uh, so I um I have my own website called TonyTheTraveler dot com. Uh, Traveler spelt with two L's, and um a Greek journalist found it. My girlfriend's from Greece. And um, a Greek journalist did an article about me 10 years ago. And my girlfriend um, is also blind. She found it on the internet on one of these social websites. So she said she liked my name. My middle name is Eric. Um, so she emailed me and we were like pen friends for a year. And then I had my kidney transplant. So I decided I'd go to Turkey for a month. I thought, okay, I've been to Turkey. I should go to Greece because they're like neighbors and long history and stuff right so i said so i emailed her said, oh, i'm coming to greece do you, do you want to meet up and go for dinner or coffee so i went to greece and eventually we met up and i went to dinner and then i was i was planning to visit all these places around greece these ancient um historical cities but, um i like this girl so I thought, oh no no I'll, i'll see more of her so i did and one thing led to another and we we formed a relationship and Uh, we'll be together nine years in November, but she still lives in Greece and I still live in England. <laughs> so, so it's a bit complicated sometimes, but it works. So, and then she travels with me when she's not working. She works in a call center. Um, her name's Tatiana, and um, she transfers calls between doctors and other staff in a hospital. Um, so yeah, that keeps her busy. And then when she's not working, she, and we're actually going to Sicily in September. Um, for my 40th so we're going to do that for three weeks and then um, next year we're going to kind of travel in the philippines and uh, we've been to the states twice in australia and new zealand together and uh, we went to russia this year so how wonderful so yeah so we get we get about together um so yeah so and she speaks languages so she helps me with the languages so she speaks english greek italian so, so, so that's 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 good fun Right, and, and you're going to live together someday, right? Yeah, I think, I think once she retires from... Uh, she can retire in about eight years. Because, um, we get different uh, rules in Greece if you're disabled. So, And then she'll probably come and live in England. Yeah, we'll live together and just travel and stuff. And Tony, how old are you? I'll be 40 in September. Oh, very young. Oh. Yeah. How old are you, if I may ask? You sound a bit younger. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much. 44. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> yeah, we're we're in the same group. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. So, my friend, my my last two questions are first: How can people buy your e-books, and what are them about? Okay, so um, unfortunately, my books are only in English at the moment, and they're e-books, so. Um, anyone can download them from Amazon or Google Play or um, Nook, Barnes and Noble, any um, ebook website, and um, and you can go to my website TonyTheTraveler.com and read more about me and my books. And they're basically about the first book's called Seeing the World My Way, and it's about why a blind person would want to go and see the world, <laughs> in a word, and it's uh -huh. about my stories of my early travels why i got into traveling i was inspired by my dad's stories when he was in the merchant navy before i was born and then going to a specialist boarding school and getting the opportunities to go to the states and it's about those adventures and the people i meet and um my drinking ex escapades and eventually going to australia and new zealand And then my second book is called Seeing the Americas My Way, and it's a journey I, I did in 2004. I started in South America, 
Um, that's about a month in Brazil. I went to Argentina. Unfortunately, it doesn't involve any uh, ex- experiences in Colombia because I didn't, I didn't get there till much later. But then I eventually travelled up through North America, Mexico, Cuba, and then finally across uh, Canada. Um, and this is um, a journey I did after I'd stopped drinking. So it's coming to terms with uh, not drinking alcohol anymore and also um, a bit of a romantic story that sort of um, didn't sort of turn out the way I sort of wanted. So it's dealing with those issues of heartbreak and stuff whilst traveling. So that's what they're about, basically. Uh, yeah, they're about five US dollars to download. And um, it sort of helps fund my traveling a little bit. So <laughs> Super cheap, my friend, and super cheap. important for our listeners. I think to buy something like this is going to help in your life, whether you have a disability or you don't. And, exactly, yeah. Yeah, and, and I would like your final advice to our listeners. We have a lot of visual impaired people who are going through a lot. They are losing their sight. People who are losing their sight yeah. and their hearing. Um, people who are listening because they have a kid who is losing mm-hmm. their sight or their hearing or both. What would you advise them to do with their lives? Um, my advice is to follow your dreams, um, to live life um, as much as possible, and to find something that you enjoy. Um, you don't have to do what I did and travel around the world and do crazy things, but my story is to, to show people and to tell people that things are possible, that you can live your dreams and follow your dreams. Um, try and keep things simple and live one day at a time and just try and have the belief and get the confidence um, that you can uh, you can do things and you can have some fun no matter the struggle and the challenges um, I'm totally blind I'm severely deaf I've had a kidney transplant and I've now got diabetes, yet I still manage to do things and have fun and yeah, so that would be my advice. Um, And if you are struggling with coming to terms with blindness, with deafness, or with both at the same time, um, try try and find someone in your family or a friend or a neighbor that you can talk to and that can try and help you get just a little bit of support or a little bit of advice. Um, It might not be from the government or, you know, but just in your neighbourhood. So we all need to help each other. So the more we can share with each other, the more we can help each other. And that's what it should be about. And there's nothing else I can say more than you just said. So... (laughs) Um, with that, um, first I want to say thank you so much, Tony, for everything, because yeah. it's been very inspiring, my friend, for everybody. I also want to say thank you to Tatiana for letting me to know you. <laughs> we were yeah. we were friends, you and I, on on social media, but I I didn't uh, know you. Uh, as, okay. as this <laughs> um, <laughs> interview allows us to and I want to say thank you to everyone who has listened to this interview and I hope many people are going to promote this talk because it can help a lot of people around the Same. world you know so Tony uh, is there an email address people can email you yeah so thank go onto my website um, or they can go to contact uh, at tonythetraveller.com and they can also find me on Facebook uh, Tony space the T-H-E space traveller and or they can they can Google or 
Um, if they go to Tony, T-O-N-Y, G-I-L-E-S, number four, they should all be able to also be able to find me on Facebook. Perfect, Tony. Thank you so much for your time and your life experiences that you have been able to share with us tonight on this very powerful show. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. My pleasure, Tony, and for our listeners, remember always to smile and follow your dreams, as Tony yeah. just said. This is Alvaro from LVV Show saying good night.